Victoria because I used to use a scrambler to work. And uh, I was, uh, you sort of kept your eyes and ears open all the time. And, and, and uh, I picked up a police car racing off to Waterglen Shopping Centre. And I tailed him. And as I got there, what had happened was three guys had decided to rob the bank. Now, I didn't know at the time because I got there as this guy was shot. But I found out afterwards, two guys were sitting in a flat, two, two flatmates, and they decided that they were going to hit a bank. And a third mate of these came and joined them who was, who was out of work. And they said, okay, well, we'll include you in this robbery. We're going to hit the, I think it was the Allied Bank at Waterloo Shopping Center. One, of, one, of, one guy's going to drive the getaway mini, you know, the old <laughs> minis. The second guy was going to pull the gun on the tellers, and the third guy's job was to go and scout to check whether the, the, the bank was deep. The third guy that drove the mini thought, you know what? If we get money from this bank, I'm going to get a third of whatever we get. I'm going to tell the cops we're coming and if I, and we mess this up, I'm going to get any more. So he figured he's going to back for both sides of it and he told the cops they're coming. So of course when they arrived the next day to check this out and the, uh, and the, and the, the first guy went inside to do the wreck and he looked and he came out and he said, shut up now, the place is clean, let's go. And the third guy went to hit the bank and the cops and, and he said, you know, let's have the money. And the cops said, no, not today. And they shot him twice, this guy, in the chest and in the leg as he ran away. And I got there seconds after this happened. And he was lying there. One of the great detectives of the day, Brute the Brain, some of you might still remember him. His favorite party trick to impress the girls was at a murder scene to stick his finger in the bullet hole and say, ah, oh, this is a nine millimeter or whatever. This, this was, the girls used to go crazy. That was his favorite party trick. So anyway, he was there and I remember standing there next to him and he said to me, this guy's gone. He's not going to make it. He reckons another five or ten minutes and he's dead. I kid you not, two days later, this guy walks into the Pretoria, he's bandaged up on crutches, and here he comes. I said, what the hell are you doing here? He says, no, I'm the guy that dropped the bag, but that was a fantastic picture. Please go. <laughs> and again, I said, I said, he signed it for me, and he said, yeah, thanks, Peter, great photo, shit, hold up. <laughs> so this is quite an interesting thing. Um, I think still now, a lot of airplanes, Junior pilots and stuff fly into the Bahamasburg over here because they get a couple of hours and they think they're great pilots and then they do silly things and they and they often misjudge the height of the of the mountain. We got a call when I was at the news about a guy that had flown into the mountain, but they couldn't locate the plane. They knew it was somewhere there. And I sent Richard Nisa out, who was one of our photographers, I said to him, go and see if you can find the go and see if you can find the, the wreck and get up there. Now, to find the wreck, you first of all drive up and down and if you see anything, it looks like a police car. You tail it, and when it looks like he's got to the way the place, you should overtake him and you get up the hill before him, otherwise they won't allow you up the hill. <laughs> so Richard was out there, and in the meantime, Ken Westerbrook, great Ken Westerbrook, he came out from Joburg, they also dashed out there. But about half an hour after they were out looking for this thing, I got a call from um, from 17 Squadron at, 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 um, at Swatkos, over at Swatkos. And they said, Peter, we're going out with a chopper to look, you want to come with, we've got five minutes to get here. And I jumped in the car, and I raced through there, and when I got there, I said to him, look, if I'm in civilian clothes, the cops are going to nail me if they see a civilian coming down. Lend me your pilot's overall, and I'll put it on so that when, when we get there, they'll think I'm part of the crew. So they put me in a pilot's uh, overall. And in the meantime, they located the, the, the crash site, but the police had cordoned it off, and the photographers weren't allowed to take pictures until the body had been removed. So we got there with a chop, we started circling, and the pilot said to me, what do we do now? I said, well, drop, the, drop me with a hoist first. Once the hoist is done, take the body, pick it up, put it into the chopper, and then drop it again and pick me up and we can get out of here. So I said, okay, he's going to do that. So as they let me down, these guys think I'm a coroner or the doctor. So I don't know. So they all start shooting a thousand pictures of me. And this is me as they drop me down. I'm like, no, guys, it's me, it's me. It's me. It's me. It's me. And it was quite funny because we then shot the pictures and as soon as I was finished, I said, right, Rich, you guys better get back to the office. I'll see you there in a few minutes. And, uh, and Ken and Rich, my black man, they said, oh, you've got a nice job. You just fly off in the job. We've got to now walk two kilos down this flipping road and stuff. And needless to say, we got back to the office and we ran the pictures and so on. And about, I think it was two or three weeks after this, um, I saw Ken at the press awards. And it was the night he won the photographer of the year. And he took my book, and I've still got the book, he took my book and he wrote in there, Do Pit, see you in the sky, chopper man. And he dated it. And four days later he was dead. He got shot in. 
So it was quite eerie. But that picture, that picture was reminds me of some of my last picture, actually. So at, a, at, a, at a national party meeting in Brits, Louis Nell, who was the Minister of Information at the time, tried his utmost to deliver a, a speech and so on. And the RV appear just disrupted his meeting. They were not interested. They had a whole lot of guys there. Uh, uh, what was the guy's name? Uh, Pete Rudolph. Pete Skid Rudolph and, and all those guys who were renowned troublemakers. They were in the middle of the hall there. And they were all yelling and they shouting and stuff. And Louis now loses his temper. Now, to this day, it's never been determined if he did that or if he did that. <laughs> and he lost his temper. <laughs> and he called the press together and he said, Gentlemen, tonight you have seen the ugly face of the Afrikaner what he said to us. The RBP got to hear about this, because we ran this picture in the paper. And they phoned me and they said, can they use this in their poster? I said, no, I can't allow you to do that, but I can't stop you if you want to do that. <laughs> they took this picture and they ran it as a billboard poster, the ugly face of the Afrikaner. <laughs> so it was quite funny, because when a fight broke out in the middle of the hall there, and I was trying to get to Mark Marnie Monitz, I think was his name, um, I was trying to get to him to get pictures again with a one meter lens and stuff like that. They had bodyguards and they had big ups stopping and all that stuff. And I put my head down and I knew it's not easy because this is now Buddha territory and I'm from Pretoria News, I'm one of the communists. But I put my head down and there's a big up <laughs> stop and he, said, and he said to me, Favari ye! And I thought, well, if I say Pretoria News now, I'm not going to see the sunrise. So I said to him, uh, a broom, you have yet by my heart, Claire. <laughs> <laughs> I went to him and I said to him, Who wrong does he know a lit from the army? He says, No, I'm not lit of the army. He says, I'm a Greek, they hired me to come and see. He had nothing to do with it. I said, I'm not from Pretoria. It's quite a funny story. This is a very interesting story. This was in early 90. I went to Sosh. There was a call out to Sosh, and the police had already shot a few guys, and the Bob cops had lined up there, and the Bob cops didn't take any nonsense. If the Bob Cups decided they're making a line here, yeah, anything in there, whether you're 99 years old in a wheelchair or 20 years old with a brick in your hand, you're going to get smacked with a bat. And when they say charge, that's it. The Bob Cups were ruthless. And the, the Bob Cups had already shot a few guys in the morning and they'd regrouped. And when I got there, they had, they, had, uh, they had cuspers, they had the dogs, they had helicopters. These boys were ready for a big party, you could see it. And I ended up. Rather coincidentally, I think because I knew how long this party is going to last if they do shoot again. I ended up with well, about 50 or 60,000 uh, demonstrators. And as they were regrouping and they, and they said, we are going to deliver this petition, I said to them, guys, we're going to get shot here. Please, there's already two or three shot today. Let's take it easy. Let's see if we can't resolve this. And they were quite taken aback that this white journalist, where's Lefty? Are you here? You remember Lefty? We well, weren't born yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they were quite taken aback that this white guy now comes and tells them, what the hell, how, how, to, how to run our demonstration. But anyway, I convinced them to hang back and not do anything. And then I walked in a, 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 a no man's land section of probably about 300 meters to the police, who were, I think there's a picture here of them. Yeah. yeah, this guy here was Colonel Sita. And I said to them, please, these guys don't want trouble. Can we just allow them to deliver a petition? And he was also just a skeptical. You're a journalist. You're not meant to be negotiating on these guys on behalf. You're signing your anyway. But I convinced him, and I went back to the other guys then, and he said, you can bring five of them to, the, to deliver the petition. I went back, and they all jumped up. They said, me, me, me. I said, no, no, no. You, 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 you. And I picked my fire. And we went back. They delivered the petition. And everything was over, and everything was happy. The problem was that the bad guys started pushing them to the front. And now the cops are starting to get fidgety because they're coming close and they're coming close and this thing is now potential balls up because they're not backing off and they can't turn up. But behind where the cops stood, about 20 or 30 meters behind the cops, there was a side road that bled off. So I went back to the cops. I said, please, they're pushing from the back. There's nothing we can do about this. Would you mind backing up 50 meters? Which was not easy. Because you know, that's now we're losing face over here if we're backing up. But anyway, a lot of pleading, a lot of negotiating, a lot of convincing, and they agreed to pull back. So they pulled back 50 meters, and they made a line just after that road, and I said to the guys, come forward, and they all came forward, and they bled off on the side road, and Murphy, not Murphy's law, but it just happened that nobody else was shot, and everybody went home, and it worked out quite well. So that was quite a special day, and, uh, 
at the time, I was just trying to get out of there because I knew it was going to last long, but it worked out quite well for everybody. Schwarzenegger was another one also at the Royal Livingston. We photographed him at Sun City. There's a picture. I'll show you now. now. He's a nice guy, but he can also be difficult. And he came out. Well, I'll tell you about the golf thing now. But this was in Zambia. I waited for him the whole day at Livingston. He landed just before sunset. I wanted to get him on this deck. And as he got up, the usual, the, the, the agents, no, you can't photograph. I don't know. He's got to go refresh in the room. I said, right, I've learned that trick before. So as he got off the bus, he had like a drink in his hand and he showed his hand. And as he got up, I went, boom, I shot the picture. You can't use that wheel suit. I said, well, if you don't want me to use that, you've got three minutes to get up to the deck. I'm like, oh, so I'm using this wheel. I don't, you better get to the deck. <laughs> and he was the most perfect gentleman. He was, he was fantastic. He had no problem shooting the picture. This was hilarious. He was at Prince Philip, or what's his name? Yeah. Yeah. So he, he goes here to the breweries that open here uh, across the road. Yeah, just over here. And you know these things, they get you know, the oats and plant, the whole story before, okay, now when he arrives, you stand here and you explain to him exactly what's happening here, and then you tell him there, and then you tell him, listen, you know, it's like serious protocol from the Buddha side. Who's going to have the honor of telling this oak how this thing works? So he walks in there, and he goes, oh, you know. <laughs> They said, oh, well, you know what, over here we produce 36,000 tons of beer in 18 hours. And what we do is the vat gets loaded over here and then it runs down the green pipe and it goes there into the red pipe and stuff like that. And he's like, he's just listening. And then the next lab takes over and he says, from the green pipe, we cap it out and bring the flash. <laughs> and so this carries on. And this carries on through three or four different rooms in this whole fat. And as they get to the end, the guy says, and then what we do is it comes out of the yellow pipe over here into the drum and that's how we bump. He says, no, 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 no. And he's like, what? No, it's impossible to come out of the yellow pipe because that gentleman sitting in the green pipe and goes, yes, look, that looks like this, but boom, God, no, so you see what happened? No, 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 that can't be, no, let's go back to the third one. Yes, my friend, he shook those arms. He was listening to every flippant word that they were telling him about it. And they were just rattling on and he was like, hmm, yes, yes. And at the end, he said, no, no, that definitely could. And it was so the whole pursuit. This was hilarious. I get a phone call from a guy. He says to me, Peter, I want you to come to the state theater. I said, yeah. He says, we're having a shoot there. I want you to come take a picture for me of cats. I'm like, oh, cats. Okay, like okay. cats are famous to play. I'd love to go photograph cats. Let's go. So I go, I go to the main hall at the state theater. He says, oh, okay, Peter, thanks. Come with me. We walk. We go down the passage to a smaller room. In a smaller room, in a smaller room, eventually we get to a little room, it's about this one. Oh, I don't know, do cats in here. And he has about 30 oaks lying around, all half dressed and half woman and, and stuff like that. He says, okay guys, action, Peter's here. Yeah, and the jumps up, and this side here, and this chick grips him, and the other ones brooks are off, and they down there. Like, this isn't the cats that <laughs> Oh man, it's not cats, it's cats. It's a gambling game, cats. The show is called Cats. And it's actually, they had quite a good note at the state, but it was so funny because I'm expecting people dressed as cats. The cops had arrested most of the photographers already. My car was parked at the, at the grave. I was photographing the, the people, the, the funeral goers, and I was hiding. I was using them as cover from the cops so they couldn't see I was there taking pictures. And after the, after the uh, funeral, when the people started thinning out, I realized they're going to find me over here, so I hid in one of the graves. So they couldn't find him. And when I looked up out of the grave, you know, you see in the Vietnam movies, and now it's brought the bushes like this. These cops had formed a line and they were coming. I didn't know at the time that they were looking specifically for me. And, and um, they came down and they actually caught me in the grave. I mean, I, I couldn't run from it. So they caught me in the grave and they said to me, What are you doing here? We got you and stuff like that. And I said, Okay. And at that stage, we used to, in the Toyota GLS, we used to hide our films between the petrol flap and the petrol cap. They never ever searched it. They would search your company all they'd look under the seats. They'd look everywhere with this <coughs> But for some reason nobody ever thought of looking there. So that was our favorite hiding space. And I've hidden a lot of my films there already. So they caught me and they took me back and the, the Colonel Jumbo Swat was how his name. He climbed on top of one of the caspers and he was trying to get all the Silverton. So Silverton was handy for the craft, but he couldn't get signal. So he called one of the campers that were there. He said, the camper, just stay with this guy. I'm just going to uh, call Silverton quickly. He gets in the customer and he drives five k's up the road or something like that. And I start chatting to this camper and stuff who couldn't give a content. Oh, hey, hey, what's up, my bro? And I start chatting to him. And about five minutes later, I said, well, Why don't you do me a favor? He says, What? 
I said, oh, no, just tell Jabba, I can't wait any longer. He must my phone me on Monday at the office. No, I can't do it. He's a car, I'm out of it. I've never caught me. Thanks, guys. The story you told me one day about shoot that you did to your house with a snake and put a woman with the guns on and, the, and your maid walking in the teeth. The guy phoned up. I want to help you out. The other phone just said, listen, we're doing a campaign. It's a, it's a fashion house. We want you to photograph some girls. I, I, I actually found that picture. <laughs> but call it, say it was called Caltex. I can't remember what it's called. So he says, I want you to photograph some naked women for me. So the first one is like this, a C, the other one is like this, like an A. And then we're going to put a big ad on a bus to say Caltex clothes or whatever the case might be. He said, okay, cool, no problem. Bring the girls to the studio. So we go to the studio. It was at my old house where the studio was right next to the house. So in all these like scrubber deluxe chicks that they know the strippers and this biker ugly leathers who's now in charge of the whole shoot. And I've got a bed in the studio as well. So they're sitting on the bed and I said, listen, before you sit down, just get undressed because the underwear and the bras leaves marks. So rather get it off nice and then so that when we start shooting, there's no marks. Does anybody want to drink anything? So yeah, I'll have two teas and a coke and a, and a glass of water and so I go, fuck up. But I've got two tears and a coke. <laughs> Who waits with my wife like this? They they big jobbies. They share secrets. Going, Martha walks in there. No, yes. Two naked chicks and they're like in leather. So she goes straight right down. She goes into the house. My wife comes over. Wants Martha. That's what. Oh, Martha, my God. <laughs> what's going on in the studio? There, she was like very upset. <laughs> that's the trials and tribulations. <laughs>